Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everybody here this afternoon. And thanks to AWE for having me here. Um, not that I'll be able to see anybody's responses, but who knows, World of Tanks? I'm going to guess there's six, seven. Uh, in the room, we're talking who's in the, actually in the games industry, developers, marketers, publishers, nice mix. And who's, who's working on, on spatial, uh, mobile spatial AR projects right now? Headset based? Okay, that's like equal responses for every one of those questions. Cool, so everybody's here. So I'm Matt Daly, um, Special Projects Lead at Wargaming, uh, and today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about our specific approach toward exploring new media technology, specifically XR, MR, AR, uh, knowing that, as we all know, and as everybody's sort of been hearing at this event, there's this sort of resonating message that you know we're sort of at this middle stage that a lot of AR, MR is kind of trending strongly toward industries, toward enterprise. So where a lot of the capital movement is. And then we're sort of like at a middle stage as far as the maturation of the medium and uh, and what it's actually useful for. Thanks. Um, so for us, we have, you know, we still want to be exploring these, these technologies. We still absolutely think that they're, that they're the future. But we have some of the same sort of similar concerns as probably a lot of the rest of the industry. Where's the addressable market? Who wants to play this stuff? Even on mobile AR, the limitations that are in, with the limitations that are involved, where's the sweet spot for actually accomplishing something? So on this path toward like an actual viable commercial future that it feels every year we're getting closer and closer to, this is sort of our approach toward exploring uh, these new media. So a little bit about Wargaming. I know that some of you said you did know about us, some, some not. We have something like 160 million registered users across our ecosystem. World of Tanks is the most famous, most, most well-known title like super popular in Russia, like a Burger King level. And then Europe, very popular, and then North America is one of those sort of like, oh yeah, World of Tanks, okay, okay. That's the response that, that's the typical response. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about it, right? We have other, other games, World of Warships, doing really well. Warplanes, not so much. Uh, lots of mobile titles, and we're sort of increasingly diversifying our platform, our, uh, our, our content offering, but in general, our meat and potatoes is basically early 20th century vehicle combat. So we kind of like own that niche, right? It's a big niche, it turns out. That's, that's an outdated map, but it gives you an idea of our spread. It's like 4,000 something employees, various offices. Give us a call if you're near any of these. Uh, we, all, we are also, we consider ourselves a media company beyond just a gaming company. We're sort of in a unique place in the industry where we have a very sort of unique and very large uh, community that's super switched on to history, right? They play these tanks, warships, they experience these theaters of battle regularly, and as many of us have seen in, in, in games, you learn whether you want to or not, whether you even realize you're doing it or not. So to, to sort of add more touch points to the, the wargaming universe and kind of add this substantive contribution to people's enjoyment, uh, we utilize, you know, we leverage our internal historical research resources, our contacts at museums, historical and heritage institutions, and we've been making, I don't know, by now it's not even 200, it's got to be like 250 or more. M millions of views, large audience, very, very diverse, unique audience for the game space. And so my group, right, takes that philosophy of sort of adding additional touch points and we're all a bunch of, you know, XR, virtual world, slash design agency geeks. And we're sort of like an internal creative agency that attempts to create that, that kind of content, those additional historical heritage touch points using new technology. And that new technology is basically meant VR and AR. There's some, there's some outliers, but I'll be focusing 
today on VRNAR and sort of talking about some highlight projects. So a lot of the, a lot of the stuff we do, one of the main sort of like uh, filters or prerequisites for going forward with these sort of agile, fast turnaround projects is that they have to have some sort of like novelty value. There has to be something sort of new and, and innovative, a, a very interesting story that we can tell about them uh, that basically we can describe in like a single headline, right? Like even before, uh, even before we've announced a project or shown it anywhere. Uh, they always have something to do with, usually always have something to do with heritage, but are always util utilizing new, new platforms. So it's important that they be sort of like coverable, like some of these clippings that you see, like me making an atrocious face on a battleship on Chinese TV. I'm pretty sure that's Chinese TV. Uh, and my colleague on, on, on BBC here, BBC Russia. Uh, we do it for the, for the R&D, obviously. You know, like, like I was saying, uh, the path toward commercial viability, it's a path. It's lily pads and it's stepping stones. And it behooves us, and I believe everyone in here, to, make, to be making intelligent and measured investments in the time and effort that you're investing into developing projects using these platforms. So for us, it's a specific sweet spot. Uh, I, like I, I was, as I was saying, there's the press and branding, uh, the sort of partnership development. By now, we're sort of, we, you know, we have the network that we would need uh, as we're moving more toward the, the actual game development, deployment, and publishing stage, which is really like exciting, and we want to be there and ready as it's as it's starting. So I'm a virtual worlds background guy. A few of my oldest colleagues and friends are here. Um, Ten years ago, playing with some AR thing, GE AR thing. That's me now. Same stuff, just a little heavier, maybe a little wiser potentially. Um, and so I've been, I've been working at, in, inside the space of virtual worlds games, uh, AR, to the extent that it's been possible, increasingly so over these years. Uh, my, my PowerPoint is not, trans, not showing the transition on the screen. It's just frozen on that last space. Okay. That's my prerequisite Black Mirror slide. That's my prerequisite Vitruvian. <laughs> Vitruvian man slide. Someone suggested I should do that, so I put it in there. So we're, we're big uh, patrons of, the, of, of heritage institutions. We have a very wide network of museum partners, uh, cultural institutes, um, heritage spaces. So this is, the, this is our CEO, Victor, giving a donation at one of the tank fests at the Tank Museum in, in southern England in Dorset, in Bovington. Uh, we share a lot, of co a lot in common with uh, the dem the, our demographics uh, have a lot in common with these institutions, and there's a really nice sort of like circular overlap there. Uh, so we do a lot of partnerships, lots of content development, and it's basically a rich uh, seeding ground for these kinds of new, new media projects that we do, right? We also have this very, very massive uh, gaming audience. It's very unique. In some cases, they're not ex actually even gamers. They're more like uh, historical enthusiasts who have been drawn to our universe because they love the authenticity. They love the texture and the experience and art the fidelity that's like really important to us. So we sort of like, we're very, the historical part is like really important to us and to them. And obviously they're, it's a big wide audience and they're very technologically switched on. They understand interactive multimedia like natively. It's like not a problem. You just drop, we've been doing this stuff for, with, this, in, with this team for like six or seven years. And since the beginning, like you just put whatever apparatus, weird dongle thing that we're, that we're developing on into one of these people's hands and they just immediately get it. It's like you don't have to explain anything. That's a highly, turns out that that's like a really highly coveted audience, right? So we bring that to bear with uh, uh, a lot of the partners that we work with, right? So this is a project, that, this is a good example project that we did in, at Gamescom in August with the History Channel. So we developed this, uh, you know, it's, it's running World of Tanks PC on Mac settings on a PC and then streaming that out to uh, an iPad running AR kit. So essentially, we've, we wanted to see how far we could push the graphical capability of any rendering methodology possible on AR. So what you're seeing is, and it seems to be confirmed by the dozens of meetings we had with like top tier press and partners and the, basically the leaders in this space, many of the leaders in this space, it's like the most badass, visually badass thing that like anyone's seen in um, in, in, in AR, in particularly in mobile AR, right? 
So it's, um, I'm not saying that just to toot, it's, toot, it's a tootable thing, I think, but it's not to toot, toot our own horn. It's to give you a sense of like uh, why it's important for us to be investing the time and resources to, be, to making this stuff um, viable, because once you get this in the hands of uh, all those press leaders, whatever partners, but also we get this in the hands of our leadership, my CEO, who's like a great co-geek, you know? There's nothing, there's nothing like actually getting the thing and putting it in front of their hands and say, now, now go, go as close as you dare to, the, to these 3D models and, and watch how it doesn't degrade, right? Like watch, look at the future, the visual future of what content in, a, in, in, in AR space is gonna look like, right? So um, there's always a, 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 this sort of like converse, like inverse correlation between how exotic the thing we're doing is and how releasable it is, right? So this thing, totally not releasable, right? It's like a bespoke, it requires a couple like specific cables, uh, a couple specific dongles. But what the, the reason I mentioned that is because the, we have the tech part, you know, we have the community part, the press part, and then the partnership part is sort of like the essential piece there, right? It's like we, we work with uh, the History Channel um, to create the actual narrative content. So when we were talking about the Battle of Kursk earlier, this was in celebration of the anniversary, uh, one of the anniversaries of the Battle of Kursk. I don't wanna misquote, but uh, biggest, biggest tank battle, biggest last tank on tank battle, right, of all time. And we have all the tanks, we're sort of the, we happen to have the, the sort of the biggest online high def, you know, HD model repository of tank models in the world. So that's, turns out we can use those. And uh, the map that you're seeing is, this is all in-game content, right? So this is one of the maps in World of Tanks PCs. And all the tanks that you're seeing are tanks that would have, would have fought uh, at Kursk. And that's our historian um, and former tank commander, Richard Cutland. So this was, uh, this, this was like one of those just really in, intensely well-received, uh, you know, Mashable wired venture beat, like, you know, it, it did, it did, it performed that aspect of earned media really well, but more than anything also kind of got us into the headspace of understanding what are the sort of considerations that one has to have when you're designing, you know, for, for a future of spatial, spatial AR, which is everything that we're sort of thrusting toward. And when I say spatial AR, I, I don't, probably don't have to make much of a distinction that I'm talking about the actual spatial mechanics of interacting, right? Not, not, uh, not geolocation. It's a conundrum, right? There's no actual manual written for this stuff. So these, so, so these projects uh, serve that role of, um, of, of, you know, sort of cutting our teeth quite effectively. Some other stuff we've done, like, you know, we worked at the RAF Museum to pull a World War II bomber out of the, the English Channel and then sort of did like a scavenger hunt sort of GPS-based scavenger hunt with uh, whatever, wh whatever Vuforia or something we were working with at the time. We have, uh, you know, this example of using in-game content sort of like cleverly and like agilely so that we uh, can produce something relatively quickly and efficiently. This was sort of our magnum opus in the sort of Google, uh, you know, cardboard days um, narrative, you know, World War II narrative experience that uses tank models and map environments from, from World of Tanks to tell this story about these three tank crews. We work with actual veterans that, that were tank, uh, that worked in tanks, that were tankers in, uh, in World War II from three different nations. Um, and we sort of mashed all those things together with what was at the time sort of like the edge of what was possible for storytelling with, with, uh, with mixed reality, which was, uh, which was Google Cardboard or advanced versions of it, basically just 360 video, right? But again, trying to push, push on those walls and see where they are and feel out in the sort of like murky darkness of, of what this, uh, of this medium, right? The same kind of thing with World of Warships, one of our other titles, where we were using it, you know, in-game assets, where we had the HMS Belfast, it's the, the, the warship on the Thames in London, it's a major warship museum. And yeah, so for us here, it's like, you know, it's creating a deeper, delightful sort of like touch point of engagement for an audience that like Ian and I were talking about yesterday, Ian also works in this museum space, where it's like, you're trying continuously as a, a, a purveyor of heritage and culture 
you're continuously trying to find ways of engaging with a younger, you know, increasingly younger audience that's more used to interacting with screens uh, and has maybe like a slightly less attention span for engaging with physical ephemeral content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that that basically means the gamer audience, right? And who basically, as a younger audience, who isn't a gamer anyway? So we take some of this sort of learnings of like from game design, you know, telepresence uh, uh, and, and uh, his heritage interpretation and try to, uh, try to create a more vivid, kind of unique, memorable, uh, spatial memory-based touch point um, by using this mix of 360 video, in-game assets, CG, um, and we try to give, give people access to parts of these museums and ships that they wouldn't normally have access to anyway. So for us, it's, that's a really important touch point for, for our audience, for our, for our community standpoint. That's another one that we did with, uh, with another English ship, this time with uh, BBC presenter Dan Snow. And this one, we actually, was our first project with Google Arts and Culture. Who here knows Google Arts and Culture? Right, so it's Google's sort of, I mean, it's self-explanatory, it's Google Arts and Culture. It's an, it's an online platform for, um, I'll just say it again, it's arts and culture, right? Um, so for this one, it was, a, it was more of a choose your own adventure kind of um, experience that involved mixed media, right? It was like 360 video, traditional media, text, audio, some in-game stuff, right? Mixed together to sort of pa paint this kind of exclusive cohesive piece where like, you know, you're hanging out with, with these two sort of uh, 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 celebrities in their own right, uh, these historians that, that, uh, that are sort of like speaking speaking to each other, but sort of imagining that the third person is the camera, that we're sort of c sharing this space together. And the, you know, as we're filming, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're making it up as we go. It's like, what's the most natural way? Certainly they're not gonna be talking to the camera. The camera can't talk back to them, right? It's not a dialogical thing. At the same time though, their body language needs to be open to the camera, right? It needs to be treating it as if it's a less talkative, maybe shy friend is the basically the, the approach that we took with that, and that seemed to work quite well. Uh, this this was another this is another sort of like tentpole project that that paid a lot of dividends in the long term and is a pretty good representation, a nice little encapsulation of a lot of the sort of philosophy and and methodology that we take for exploring new media in general, right? So every year at, at the Tank Museum in Bovington, Tank Museum's like a there. It's a, they're a big partner of ours. Like we do a lot of stuff with them every year, uh, throughout the year, and particularly at Tank Fest. So Tank Fest is pretty self-explanatory. It's a tank festival with lots of tanks, right? Uh, and and they, they have this you know, amazing collection, really. Um, it's uh, probably the most, if you were to go to a tank museum, like a destination tank museum, I would say you would just go to this one. Uh, and, and it's a great vibe there. Every year they do Tank Fest, and Tank Fest 2017, 2017, they were uh, unveiling their new Tiger collection, which was basically an unprecedented collection of these historical artifacts um, that had never been sort of like all demonstrated in the same space at the same time. But they were missing one, and that's their methodology for showing that they're missing one with gaffer tape in a square. Um, they're missing the Sturmtiger, which is a, this is sort of like a super rare, two in the world kind of rocket launcher tank that we actually have in the game, but is kind of deprecated because it's very overpowered because it's a rocket launcher tank. So we were playing with HoloLens at the time, and we thought, well, this is the perfect opportunity for us to utilize the, the mixed reality rendering and spatial computing power of, the, of this device. Uh, as well as Tango at the time, uh, to, to uh, supplement their collection and basically bring, like quite literally, metaphorically and literally bring the vehicle that we have from World of Tanks into the space and make it a permanent uh, installation. So this is like some early tests we were doing with like you know, portals, you know, how would be, what would be the most sort of like effective regret, like you know, recurring theatrical way to, to show this vehicle coming into the space. Um, so we were playing with that on one of the site visits. Uh, the, the vehicle that it's, that it's driving in next to is like s the same vehicle from the, from the bottom down. It's also like the crown jewel of the collection, like probably one of the most famous tanks in the world, the Tiger 131. 
It was in Fury. It was in the Brad, Brad Pitt film Fury. So one of, the, one of the learnings from here that's really interesting one, particularly since we're not quite in the age, not quite yet in the age of contextual spatial computing where there's like this deep level of room understanding and algorithmic sort of like uh, automatic placement of stuff. We've seen it, right? We've seen like pieces here and there. But like in this sort of like uh, relatively brute force level stage that we're at right now, having <coughs> the two, the, the fake vehicle next to the real, real vehicle, because they're so similar and in fact identical from the, from the waist down, made it like uh, an immensely grounding experience. So much so that when we had, we posted some screenshots of the virtual Sturm Tiger coming into the space next to its sister tank, the Tiger 131. There was, a, there was, you know, we would get feedback like that's a really cool, basically conveying that people didn't understand that there was a fake tank there, right? There was a, this immensely sort of grounding uh, effect that it had. So in general, when developing these site-specific experiences, it's a bit like sculpture. It's, it, I mean, it's not like uh, we're inventing this methodology, but like deeply consider the space that it's going to be in and use every grounding trick that you possibly can to make it feel as present and real as possible. So we, we, we launched it at TankFest, uh, like the, all the demographic spectrum was there. Everybody was, uh, was pretty much blown away. It was just sort of like nobody had ever seen anything like this before. And I think inside of the space, inside of this sort of echo chamber that we, that we work in, maybe sometimes we forget that even some of the most basic of things, not to mention sort of elaborate, you know, uh, choreographed tanks, full tanks coming into the space, even the most basic of things can often surprise and delight. So that's one thing I would say for sure, to remind yourself that many people, even if they've heard it, even if they've seen the video of it, like many have never touched it before. And it's, you know, it's that increasingly surprising thing because we all have it in our, like by now most of us have, you know, AR, AR um, capable platforms, devices just sitting in our pockets. Yet it's still, we're still struggling to figure out how to get it into people's hands, right? And recurringly get it into people's hands. So this, uh, Surprise, delight, the press, the whole thing that I've already talked about, right? It's still at the museum. Um, if you go down to, to Dorset and visit the museum, you'll see the installation and these gigantic tango devices uh, that are like a brick because they're like covered in metal and uh, they're just massive. Like that, you can see it there. It's like a bludgeoning object. We took it on tour, right? It like, it suddenly there was like an appetite from Internally and externally, with partners with other events, uh, we took it to, to TGS, we took it to Russia, uh, all over the place. Went on a world tour, um, doing the same thing in a lot of these places. Surprising, delighting, observing, just lots of observation, documentation, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, it then parlayed, we parlayed that into uh, this AR Core launch app for, the, for when they, they were doing, Daydream Team was launching AR Core games uh, on Google Play at two GDCs, last year's GDC. So we had the, the demo sort of like, uh, we ported it to AR Core at the time and uh, had it at the Google booth and added some social media functionality, heavily ruggedized it, added some social media capturing and sharing functionality. And this was like a, whatever, March of last year, like a year and a couple months. And we're still, we still get these automated emails that we still have now somehow in this app like, we didn't continue promoting it. We don't know where these people are, uh, but somehow people are still using this app for some purpose, right? So for us, this sort of like sweet spot of usefulness is like somewhere where that heart is, right? It's intriguing, but it's functional. Like it actually works. Not everybody has it, but it's an, it's an indication of things to come and what kind of functionality we're going to be seeing in the next in the next like relatively near near ish envelope, um, and then of course not the shake weight. And this is the kind of face that we love to see: this sort of mix of surprise, delight, and terror uh, of things to come. Uh, and it's it's usually an indication that that we're that we're in the right. We're in the right space, right head space and design space. So one of the things that I would say for sure is it's really important to do your case study. If you're doing it, if you're, if, even, if you're, if, even if it's an app, right? Even if it, you're releasing it to the public, it's a game. Uh, it's really important to have a video case study of some kind 
because 95% of the audience you could be addressing uh, are not gonna play with your app, right? Uh, they're gonna see it, they're gonna be, and then you're gonna be priming them for like the next stage of, of what is possible. Like the next time they see an app, it's gonna make a lot more sense to them, and then probably they'll download it, maybe they'll use it once, and maybe the next time an another app is released, it'll, we'll have an increasing vocabulary for this kind of stuff culturally, and then they'll, they'll lift it up twice, you know? It's this sort of stepwise thing, but the case study is like super important. Have it on your phone, case it on your phone, because uh, unfortunately, despite the fact that we have the install base now, suddenly at this moment, it's still this challenge to actually get people to pick up the phones and, and do it. Um, yeah, manage expectations internally. Like, you know, you're not, probably not, you know, creating the be all end all of, of gaming, but, but, you know, set the expectation correctly so that internally and externally, people are appropriately surprised and delighted, right? Even if it's not a game, even if you're not releasing it, particularly if you're not releasing it. Pay attention to audio, know your audience. Please, like, spray down your headsets and uh, be very careful about uh, health and safety. A nice filter for all this stuff is if you can explain it in one sentence from a, from a pitching standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, it's really, that's, that's a winner. Uh, be careful with people's brains is one. And also just, uh, you know, this, the space that we live in and work in is not, uh, it's not the first time anybody has, has thought of these things. It's just a specific amalgam of different concepts from different disciplines and industries. And these are just some, some additional things that we think about regularly when we're talking about uh, mixed reality experiences. Some immersive theater, some of the, the, the VR co cognitive development and therapy studies and uh, studies in therapy that, that are being done. Uh, various themes of psychonautics as well as uh, some really interesting stuff happening in AR, which is its own separate topic, right? So all of this is leading toward us now, you know, getting into the stage of doing like the actual spatial AR game prototyping, which is its own separate talk probably for the next time. But it's very exciting. It's a very exciting moment right now because it just, it's all sort of like working, right? It's just a matter of getting it, getting it in people's hands. So um, thanks a lot. And I'm happy to take questions. If anybody has questions, I have a couple minutes. Nobody? All clear? Okay. Great, thanks.